and welcome to another episode of the Enter the Bible podcast, where you can get answers or at least reflections on everything you wanted to know about the Bible, but were afraid to ask. I'm Katie Langston. And I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And uh, we have as our special guest today, our friend Ralph Jacobson, who is another professor of Old Testament, like me, uh, at Luther Seminary. Uh, And uh, he's going to help us. Well, first of all, welcome, Ralph. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Glad to be here. And uh, today we're going to do a lightning round. So for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, occasionally we do uh, we we bunch uh, a bunch of questions together that came to us online on enterthebible.org, and we try to answer them as uh, succinctly as possible while still giving them some uh, some time. So all of these questions came from listeners at enterthebible.org. If you have a question. Uh, that you would like answered on the podcast, please go to enterthebible.org and enter it. We can't address all the questions, but uh, we'll try to address as many as we can, or that's what we try to do. So uh, first question in this lightning round, we're going to do four questions, and we're going to do it kind of along the lines of... um, uh, you know, the the order of the books in the Bible that they refer to. So... uh, First question from a listener is, where did Cain get his wife? What is the background of her ancestry? Because only four people lived at the time. Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. And then Abel died, and then Seth. Right, exactly. How did Cain get a wife? The Bible isn't true. One of the things about the Bible that will drive you nuts if you let it is all the questions you have that the authors apparently don't care about. Uh, whether it's, I mean, that there's no, that's true, that's true. That there's that's so many. Well, the the questions I had um, was it just Jesus that saw the bird descend, the spirit descend on him like a dove, or did other people? It doesn't say. It. Did Jesus know he was the Messiah already? Doesn't say. I mean, so that there's all these uh, questions that will drive you nuts. And this is one of them. So the answer is nobody knows. Is that it? Well, it does. It doesn't say. It just says, like you said, apparently there's four people living, but then Cain has a wife. And then he's given the mark of Cain to protect him so that anyone who comes upon him won't kill him. Well, wait, where did those people that are going to come upon him come from? And so the Bible's not interested, or at least the authors that uh, don't seem to be interested in those questions that, uh, like, where did the other people come from? Did God just make a bunch of other people? Yeah. Don't say. Yeah. And uh, obviously this also addresses or begs the question about whether this is a historical tale or not, which I think we've perhaps talked about in other podcasts, but if you believe it's more of a theological, even mythological tale, then obviously um, this isn't as important, probably. Uh, If you, if you do believe it's a historical tale and that's fine, uh, you, you are welcome to believe that we're not going to try to dissuade you. Then I think, yeah, Rolf's answer is probably the best. We don't know. Uh, And the biblical writers don't seem to, wonder about that. I, m- I might try to dissuade you from reading it as a historical tale. I don't think your salvation depends on, you know, if you read it or don't read it that way. But I, I think I would say that the evidence is pretty clear that it's not a historical tale, but that doesn't make it not scripture. We've talked about this a lot in terms of um, different genres of different books. And uh, I think people get tripped up in their faith uh, unnecessarily over questions like this, um, where, um, people say, well, it's obvious that, you know, that, that, that we can't trust the Bible because, uh, there are only four people living and there's this contradiction that other people, you know, uh, are around at the time. And therefore, you know, we can't believe what the Bible says. And and so while I respect and, uh, uh, you know, would still consider you a brother or sister in Christ if you have a more literal reading on the Bible. I might try to dissuade you from that reading of this particular passage just because it can be a stumbling block to people and it doesn't need to be. I think that's fair. Yeah. All right. Our second question is related uh, to the first one in the uh, sense that it comes also from the first chapters of Genesis. 
And that second question is this, can you put some perspective to the old, old age of the humans referenced in Genesis? 900 plus years, question mark, exclamation mark, question mark. So 900 plus years? Um, so for those people who don't know uh, what this particular listener is talking about, uh, there are genealogies in Genesis, particularly in Genesis 1 through 11, that um, talk about really long-lived people. So look particularly at chapter 5 in Genesis. So uh, Adam himself uh, lives 930 years. So the first man lives 930 years. Um Methuselah is the longest lived um, man in the Bible. So starting in verse 25, um, he li- talks about who he, uh, his children. And then in verse 27, 527, thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. So that's a very long time to live. So Ralph, what do we what do we say about this? Well, it's, it's not even it's not even just those, but those are uh, the longest. Abraham is said to uh, live 175 years, and then Moses even lives 120 years. Oh yeah, so, I realize that. Um, but then it says in the Book of Psalms, um, the measure of a human life is 70 years or 80 if someone's really strong. Mm. Um, so. Um, in general, the in Genesis so through the Pentateuch, then the age, the the age of people goes down. I think there's I think there's two general uh, ways of interpreting it. Um, I've normally interpreted it as the Bible is signaling to you that we're that it is moving from prehistory mm. uh, uh, tales with some mythic elements. Mm. They're not myths, but they're they have some mythic elements. So the uh, by the age there it's signaling to you they're moving from this prehistory into into history and that the ages aren't uh they're not st- they don't only decrease you know with every generation so, you know Methuselah lives a little longer um but I think that's the interpretation that I uh go with uh, I think the Bible's telling us that we are we're not to read those early chapters as history Mm-hmm. I think uh, another uh, way of reading it might be some sense of moving away from from like the uh, golden age, so like mm. a sense of sin increasing. Um, oh. Some people read it that way. I think I that doesn't make as much sense to me because the flood story in Genesis six kind of um, doesn't this that suggests that r- right there you're. You are full on sin. There's no increase of sin. <laughs> so there is there is that weird story right before the flood story. Right, I'm looking at uh, Genesis chapter six of the the daughters of men and the sons of God. You know, intermarrying. Yeah. Intermarrying. That is a weird, that that is a weird yeah. story. But then yeah, in verse three, the, the mythic says, element there. Yeah. yeah. Then the Lord said, "My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be one hundred twenty years." So that seems to be the right. turning point, right? That that human sin or this kind of crossing of boundaries between the heavens and the earth um, uh, leads God to say, "Yeah, no, no more nine hundred year old humans. Uh, <laughs> you only get to live to one hundred and twenty years." So, which of course, you know, many of us, yeah, that's pretty unusual even today. I don't even know, yeah, people live that long, but uh, very few, very very few. So uh, yeah, so there's some some textual um, signaling there. I think that the biblical writers realize that that's a really long, <laughs> kind of <laughs> mythic uh, time or uh, length of life there, nine hundred and some years. Yeah, but yeah, I I like that. So that so part of you know what we were talking about in the first question, like part of that uh, the character of those first stories in Genesis. Uh, is signaled by the, these incredibly long lifespans as well. That makes sense. All right. Awesome. Uh, next ones uh, are really can be a lightning round, I think, because uh, um, they're, well, two two related questions. Who wrote the book of Joshua? Who wrote First Chronicles? I think we can Joshua say Joshua? We, we don't know. Mr. Don't Chronicle. Know. No. <laughs> I think we could say more than that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
first of all, Joshua, like most of the books in the Bible, is anonymous. It doesn't say anywhere in there who wrote it. Uh, traditionally, uh, it was, uh, I think, especially in early Jewish and Christian um, legend, it was viewed that Joshua was the author, even though it doesn't say that. Um, most modern scholars uh, believe that Joshua is part of something called the Deuteronomistic history, which uh, is everything from Deuteronomy through Second Kings, except Ruth, which was written later and inserted. And the belief is that uh, I follow the school that believes that that block of uh, books was um, edited together, really not authored, edited together by a group of uh, a group of scribes who lived shortly before the exile, and then um, it was then the last few chapters of Second Kings were added during the exile when it reached its final form. And uh, because no one likes to say the word deuteronomistic, we just say DTR. It's a lot easier. Right. Yeah. Now, and it's just to, related to the book of Deuteronomy, obviously. Yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. yeah. Because, it has, it, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm remembering from my classes with the two of you uh, back in the day, uh, that really the um, maybe theological question driving these books is why did we get exiled? Like, what did we do wrong? Right. And the answer from this DTR source is like, because we really messed it up. Is that oversimplify oversimplifying or am I forgetting something? If, the, if, if it, the school of people that thinks it was written once during the exile or edited together, by the way, from sources so that there's really ancient sure, sure. material in it. Of course. I mean, I just want to mm -hmm. say that. So it's not like right. somebody in exile wrote it down. Right. They're using really old sources. Um, and compiling it and uh, crafting the, a narrative. The, the, yeah. The group of scholars, uh, and they're mostly Germans, uh, where this uh, originally theory was, was that, yes, it would, this happened during the exile in one edition, and that was the main question. An American scholar named Frank Moore Cross, uh, uh, um, I don't know if he originated with him, but um, uh, said, said, no, there's a lot more going on, and it seems that there was a uh, an earlier ending point mm -hmm. uh, about the time of the Josianic uh, Reformation. King Josiah, he remodels the temple, and then he has a Reformation, and probably then that the first edition um, was part of that Reformation. And um, it's uh, as part of the Reformation, it, the story is, uh, the national story is um, brought together. Yeah, and there's... Yeah, thank you for expanding on my rather flippant uh, response. We we don't know who the authors uh, are, but yeah, uh, that we think that they were this Deuteronomistic school influenced by the Book of Deuteronomy, uh, and and yes, I think Katie, it, that is one of the questions, certainly of the final form of the book, uh, the uh, Book of Joshua and and the rest of the Deuteronomistic history. But it's also there's also like overarching themes like covenant is a big theme in Deuteronomy and the Deuteronomistic history, including the Book of Joshua, and um, you know uh, the worship of one God uh, in in one place in Jerusalem and uh, various other various other themes that are, are present uh, across that whole history. So. Um, yeah, probably reaches uh, edited into its final form or has its second edition, you might say, during the exile, but certainly uses earlier material from from Israel's history. Um, what about First Chronicles? So the the um, tradition, Jewish tradition and Christian tradition, says that the scribe Ezra wrote First Chronicles, but again, uh, it doesn't say that in First Chronicles. So. What do we know? So often scholars refer to the person who wrote first and second chronicles, right, which are originally one book, uh, call uh, him the chronicler. Whoever it is, is writing uh, later than the Deuteronomistic history because uh, they use the stories from the Deuteronomistic history, especially first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. Um, but they kind of they have a some uh, aims, some theological aims 
as they retell those stories. So they kind of clean up the story of David, for instance, so that uh, the story of uh, Bathsheba and Uriah is not told in uh, the books of Chronicles. So do you want to add anything to that, Ralph, about how Chronicles differs from? Yeah, well, first and second Chronicles cover covers the same time period as first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, uh, except for it cuts out the Northern Kingdom completely. So the Northern Kingdom is not included. And like you said, uh, it's very pro-Davidic. It cleans up David and it... Um, it really is uh, much more positive about the Davidic monarchy in general. Um, so it, um, like you said, uh, they normally call the author the chronicler. And uh, we believe, most people believe it was written uh, written down um, af- much later, at, or at least 100 years post-exile. So if if uh, if the Deuteronomistic history is exilic, it's at least post-exilic, and a lot of people think it's probably 200 years later than um, DTR. All right. So I, I'll, I'll put in a plug uh, for a previous episode that we'll put in the show notes. Um, I, I don't remember what we ended up titling this episode, but it was with Cameron Howard, and my internal title for it was Chronicles, Not As Boring As You Thought. Um, where we go into a little bit more uh, on that history, um, if you're interested. I do remember one of the main takeaways from that was Cameron was saying pretty much the point of the chronicler was like, yay, David. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Uh, Last question for this particular lightning round uh, is this. Why weren't the children of Israel born in the wilderness, circumcised during the wilderness experience, why wait until after getting to Gilgal? So, um, again, for listeners who may not be familiar with this story, it's told in Joshua, speaking of Joshua, uh, Joshua chapter 5, uh, right around verses, well, 1 through 8, basically. Um, and so uh, this is uh, after the children of Israel, after the wilderness wanderings, after the crossing of the Jordan, uh, but before um, the fall of Jericho, and uh, as they after they've uh, crossed the Jordan, um, it says uh, all the surrounding kings heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan, and their hearts melted with, within them. And then the Lord says to Joshua, uh, "Circumcise the Israelites a second time." That sounds painful, but it's really as you read on, sounds uh, it's not quite that. It's circumcise those who have the, the, the men uh, and the boys who haven't been circumcised yet. That is, it says later, uh, those who were born during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. So hmm. why weren't they circumcised in the wilderness when they were born? Ralph, what do you think? The Bible, it'll drive you nuts if you let it. <laughs> that We have questions that the biblical authors don't answer. <laughs> Uh, and this is one of them, just like uh, just like where did Cain's wife come from? Yes. Uh, the text doesn't say. Yeah. Is there any good midrash about it? Or there, have the rabbis said anything about it? Probably. Uh, I don't know, uh, though. Do you, uh, Catherine? I do not. I'm guessing that they did have something to say about it, but I do not know. Uh, I don't have my it. Jewish study Bible um, with me at this location, so I can't look to see. One thing to note, uh, as you read along in verse 3, it says, So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeah Ha'arloth, uh, sorry, Ha'arloth, uh, which translated means hill of the foreskins. So apparently this is a place that people know the name of. It's somewhere uh, around Gilgal or close to Gilgal. Um, so... Some of this could be what we call an etiological tale. That is, uh, how did this place get its name? That's a kind of weird name, right? Hill of the Foreskins. How does it get that name? Well, this is what happened, right? Like uh, there was a mass circumcision at this place, and that's why it got its name. Now, again, uh, as Ralph said, uh, probably the best answer is we don't know because the biblical authors don't go into that detail and don't seem concerned with it. 
I did just Google it for what it's worth. And yeah. according to the Torah.com, which could never yeah. be wrong. And I will share this link. That we'll is a good site. That's a good site. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Um, it says the Babylonian Talmud notes uh, the problem and says uh, probably um, because it would it was dangerous. Um, and then another reason they said is the reason they didn't circumcise since the northern breeze is what heals bloody wounds. And without it, circumcision would be dangerous. And they didn't have a northern breeze in the wilderness. I'm going so, with that. There you go. Yeah. That's something to get into. Yeah. And I'll and we'll share uh if there's more in there too, if you wanna read more. All right. Well, uh that I think does it for this lightning round. We'll have another lightning round as well. And uh thank you, Ralph, for your input. And uh we'll we'll ask uh our listeners to go to enterthebible.org uh, f- to submit more questions. Perhaps one of your questions will be in a future episode or a future lightning round. Uh, and while you're there, check out the other resources there. There are, uh, there are more podcasts. There are um, entries on, on all the biblical books. There are uh, blog posts. There are maps. There's all kinds of resources there. So uh, like and subscribe if you enjoyed this podcast and share it with a friend. Thanks so much.